heart. And I am Coram Deo, your host for Tuesday night Bible study. And we are going through the book of Romans. And it's always a delight to have all of you here for tonight's study. Just as an, as an introduction, uh, the driving concern of God in creation and redemption is to bring glory to himself by saving a people who will serve him and declare his magnificence around the world. Our theology, therefore, must be focused first and foremost on the glory of God in all that his character and works. Amen. So our format today is worship, prayer, study, comments, and questions. And we will begin with a song. And this is an oldie. <laughs> You'll be able to play the song right in the room. And when you are done, please type done when you are finished and we will continue.
Amen and amen. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that is by your blood that you have saved us and that you have raised us to the heavenly heights, Father. You have transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into your glorious kingdom of light. It's nothing that we have done, nothing within us, but all because of your sheer unmerited grace and mercy, Father. We thank you, we praise you, we glorify your name. And now we ask you to help us to understand your word that we can be more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our scripture, as we finish up, uh, Romans 11, for three chapters, actually we can say for 11 chapters, Paul has been explaining the marvelous, wonderful grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And look what he does at the end of chapter 11. What happens when we understand the grace of God, when we have received that grace, that mercy that we did not deserve? Well, like Paul, we should always break into marvelous, spontaneous praise and worship for his goodness. Look what Paul says. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever amen so we're finishing up romans chapter 11 today don't despair there's more to come there's another five chapters of romans coming up but if you've noticed in all of paul's letters he will begin with what we call the indicatives of grace. Paul has been explaining everything that God has done for us and everything that God has done in us through his marvelous, wonderful grace. That's the whole reason I chose this song because it begins with, the song begins with what God has done for us. And it's, and it's the words were with his blood, he has saved me. Notice these words are in the past tense. This is what God has done for you and for me with his power. He has raised me to God be the glory for the things he has done. Those are the indicatives. Those are the things that we are. Those are the things that God has made us, that he has created us to be. Then if you read all of Paul's letters, he will turn from there to what's called the imperatives of grace. In other words, as a result, what is our reaction to what God has done in, in us? Well, then he gives those things that we are to do now as we are newly new creatures, creations. One, one, I'm mixing that word up because one translation says we're new cre creatures, one says we are new creations. Because we are new creations in Christ, how now shall we then live as a gratitude, as a thankfulness for what God has already done? Those are called the imperatives. What does God want us to do? He has all authority, all power over us to tell us what to do to obey him. And you notice the song went into those just now because of what God has done. Let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to thee. And if I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. So we're going to finish up with these indicatives today in chapter 11. Next week, when we get into chapter 12, we will go into those imperatives. Very important. But so far, 
we finish our study today in Romans 11. And by way of review, let me briefly show what Paul has expounded on the first 11 chapters in his book. Romans, Romans 1 through 3. Paul expounds on the terrible condition of our hearts and the hearts of all humanity. It is because of Adam's sin that we are depraved human beings, unable and unwilling to seek after God. And then beginning in verse 20 of chapter 3 through chapter 5, he talks about the great work of Christ on the cross to provide a righteousness, a sacrifice, so that we could be justified, that is, be declared righteous by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. Then in chapter 6, 7, and 8, he talks about the mighty sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to conquer sin, to make us secure in the love of Christ. Because we've been set apart, we've been set free from the penalty of sin. Now we are working out that great salvation and we are being set free from the very power of sin in our own lives. Then we just finished with chapters 9, 10, and 11, where Paul gives the great defense of God's sovereign grace and promise-keeping faithfulness in bringing both Jews and ultimately Gentiles to salvation. And our last study closed with these words in Romans chapter 11, verse 32. He closes with this, God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And notice how Paul responds to all of this revelation, all of the ways and the judgments and the perfections and the compassion and love of Christ, Paul breaks into explicit wonder and praise. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unscrutable are his ways. So this is where God wants us to be after we have heard the first 11 chapters. We should be amazed at mercy. We should be worshiping God through Jesus Christ. This is the response that will make us able to live out the practical moral demands of Romans 12 through 16. Morality in the Christian life is not simply a willpower to do right things because God has the authority to command them. Christian morality is the overflow of a worshiping heart, worshiping the sovereign, merciful God. Christian life is the fruit of a mind and a heart that is transformed by seeing and savoring the all-sufficiency, the sovereignty, the mercy of God revealed in Christ Jesus. And that will be plain to us as soon as we turn to chapter 12. But that comes next week. So hold on, it's coming up. So Paul has been outlining for us how God has sovereignly designed and controlled salvation history. There was a long period of time, several, a couple thousand years from Abraham to Christ when he permitted the Gentile nations to go their own way while he revealed himself to the Jews. But then the Jews rejected their Messiah and God brought a partial hardening on them. In many ways, this hardening even went back to the time of Moses, but it was intensified when the nation crucified the sinless Son of God. At that point, while preserving a remnant of saved Jews, God opened the door of his mercy to the Gentiles, who are now coming to salvation in unprecedented numbers. But in the future, God will keep his covenant promises to the fathers by showing mercy again to the Jews. And as we studied last week, so all Israel will be saved. The main idea now that comes out through our text is the immensity of God, the relative pure, punitive 
the, the puniness, I can't get this word out, puniness of man. Think of how puny we are in the sight of God. But yet God chose, God elected, God decreed to set his salvation on ungodly sinners. What a marvelous God we serve. I love the way Charles Hodge says it. Few passages, even in the scriptures, are to be compared with this in the force with which it presents the idea that God is all and man is nothing. Isaiah 40, from which Paul cites here, says it like this. not sure what I did there. It's coming up. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. And I love the verse in Ephesians that says, but God, amen. But for those words, we are nothing. But God chose to set his love upon us. That's another good one, Isaiah Chapter 40, all flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The glass, grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Paul is also going to cite from Job where for four chapters, God grills Job on where he was when God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. God relentlessly hammers home the truth that he alone is great and no man, not even the most righteous man on the face of the earth can compare to him. And that brings out Paul's main point, which is this. Since God is greater than you can comprehend and you are not great, humble yourself before God and worship him. That's our position. We fall humbly at the feet of Christ and we worship at his feet and we proclaim him King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And here are the words of Job when he said, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, and now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's how great our God is. And that's a great quote that Psalmist put up from Jonathan Edwards. God does not choose man because they are great, but makes them great because he has chosen him. That's the indicative. That's what Christ has done in us. And now we turn to him in praise, in adoration, and blessing. Paul's going to bring out five points. Let's look at that first one. I'll start at the end. Verse 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and amen. So that first point, all things are from him and through him. So because God's riches and wisdom and knowledge are unfathomably deep, verse 36 is true. The ultimate origin, the ultimate cause, or the ultimate decisive reason for everything is God. Everything comes from God. Let's look at just a few verses here. Ephesians, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been 
predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. It's all of God. It's nothing in us, nothing that we could obtain, nothing that we even wanted. Romans 9 says, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Proverbs 16, the lot is cast into the lot lap, but its very decision is from the Lord. Everything is dependent for its existence on God at its beginning and all the way through, along from him and through him. That means there is no explanation for what is or what happens that is deeper or more decisive than God. This is what we mean when we say that God is absolutely sovereign. Now, the devil is not co-eternal with God. He is not ultimately independent of God. His existence and all that comes from it so much of the evil in the world depends on God's willing him to exist and allowing him moment by moment to do what he does. God sees it coming. He permits it to happen. And since he does nothing aimlessly, recklessly, or capriciously, there is always a purpose for what he causes to happen directly and what he permits to happen indirectly. So in that sense, we can say that even the evil and the calamity of the world are included in verse 36, in all things. God is the source, he is the sustainer, and he is the rightful end of everything that exists and everything that happens. There is another sense in which we must not say that not say that all things are from God. Look at 1 John. Uh, I think it's chapter 2. There it is. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all of that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So here John says that these things, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride in possession, these things are not from God. So in one sense, all things are from God, but in another sense, these evil things are not from God. Sin does not come from God's nature. That is, it is not an extension or an aspect of God's nature or character. God is holy. There is none, no unholiness in him. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. The darkness and unholiness of sin do not arise as part of God's nature or character. They don't come from him in that sense. Sin can be from God and through God in the sense of ultimate and decisive cause, but not in the sense that sin comes from his nature or character. God wills that sin be without himself sinning. I like the way Todd Friel says it, that God uses sin sinlessly. It is not a sin when God, with infinite wisdom and holiness, ordains that sin exist. Sin is from him as the one who allowed it, but not from him as the expression of his character and nature. So all things are from God in the sense that he ordains all that comes to pass, but all sinful acts are not from God as an expression of his nature. We can never blame God for our own sin. So the practical lesson, the application of this truth, is that we are utterly dependent on God for all things. 
and that we are utterly responsible and guilty for the evil in our own hearts. The effect that this should have is deep humility. The fact that all things are from God and through God excludes boasting or pride in any sense whatsoever. Yes, that's a perfect example is God allowed his own son to be crucified by sinful man. So it's, we can't blame God for our sin. I agree with I, we cannot blame any one else for our own iniquity. It's me standing faultless before the throne through the righteousness of Jesus Christ and nothing within me at all. Which brings us to point number two. Paul points out that no one can give a gift so as to make him a debtor. Verse 35, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. So since all is from God and through God, he owns all things and we can never give him anything that is not already his. This means that we can never put God in our debt. He owes us nothing. He does not even owe us salvation. There is absolutely no negotiating with God. We have no bargaining position. We are utterly owned and we are squatters on his earth, his territory. Every breath we take is a gift. Every righteous act or every virtue we perform is all of grace. It's all of his. Look what Paul says in, in the book of Acts. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all to all mankind, life and breath and everything. Taught the grandchildren yesterday, we, they learned a new word, a seity. That means God is self-sufficient. He needs nothing. He requires nothing. He is not dependent on anything. He did not need to create. He did not need to save. He is all sufficient, all within himself. So since all is from God and through God, he owns all things. We can never give anything that is not already his. I, I, I kind of kidded with my wife one day when we were uh, getting ready for church and writing out our offering check. I said, you know what? I could empty out our bank account because it's all his. None of it, you know, we, we squabble, should I give 10% or 20%? Do, do I base that on my net income? Well, I'll, I'll state up front, I don't believe in tithing. The tithe was a tax to the state of Israel, to the nation of Israel, I, and, and they gave much more than 10%. I believe in cheerful giving, and he owns it all. We could. We could empty out our bank accounts and still it would all belong to him. It's all his. It's all for his glory. So, didn't mean to get off on a ta tangent, sorry. In fact, we owed a debt we could never pay. We owed a debt we could never pay. You think of the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, clearly demonstrates that there's nothing we can give God, nothing we can add to his nature or his being. He is totally and utterly self-existence. This is his aseity, which is his attribute of independent self-existence. God is the source of all things. He is the one who originated everything. He is the one who sustains everything that exists. The aseity of God means that he is the one in whom all other things find their source, their existence, and their continuance. He is the ever-present one the power that sustains all of life. There is no other source of life and none other like him. 
So because of the aseative of God, we can depend upon him as the independent one who is able to deliver, to protect and keep those who trust in him. Those whom God has purposed for salvation will come to Christ and nothing can hinder them and nothing can thwart the predetermined will of God from coming to pass. Let me quote from the Westminster Confession of Faith. I like that shalom of thine own have we given thee. God hath in all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself and is alone in and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creatures which he has made, nor deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. He is the alone fountain of all being, of whom through him, whom, and to whom are all things, and has most sovereign dominion over them to do by them, for them, upon them, whatsoever himself pleaseth. In his sight all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature, so as nothing is to him contingent or un certain. He is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, and in his, all his commands. To him is due from angels and men and every other creature whatsoever worship, service, or obedience he is pleased to require of them. That's a mouthful. Narrow it down to say this. We owe God everything he owes us nothing but yet he gives and he gives and he gives again what a gracious god how can we not fall at his feet in worship and praise for the glory of god and for his goodness to us brings us to point three no one can give any counsel to god about how he should do things Verse 34, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? In this verse, Paul gives a specific example of how we cannot give God anything to obligate him or enrich him. No one has known his mind in such a way as to be his counselor. We know something of his mind because of the revelation found in nature and in God's revealed word of scripture. God has revealed himself through his incarnate son. Paul has given us 11 chapters of the mind of God, and we are meant to understand it. But no one knows the mind of God in a way that we can become his counselor. That's almost ludicrous to even say that. So the specific thing you cannot give to God here is counsel. And this is the one thing that sinners presume most often to give God, that is counsel. They don't offer love or delight or faith or hope. They offer counsel. They tell God outright by or by implication, God, I don't like the way you run the world. I think I could do better. That's utter blasphemy to a holy and omniscient God. The world is filled with self-righteous and intelligent people who think that they know better than God. The one thing Paul explicitly says we cannot give and dare not give is what proud sinners most often give. They tell God how he should run the world and warn him that if he doesn't run it their way, they won't believe in him. It's, it's like a diabetic child would say to his pediatrician, don't give me any more shots. And if you stick me with that insulin needle, insulin needle again, I'm never coming back. <laughs> As if that were a threat to God. Never try to no negotiate or bargain with God. Do the one thing he requires. Trust him explicitly. Choose to trust him without wavering, without questioning, questioning. explicitly trust his will for your life. That is what God requires of us. Total 
trust. Amen. I echo that prayer, Butler. Lord, help us to trust you more. Brings us to point four. His ways and judgments are unsearchable and inscrutable to our finite minds. Since all is from God and through God so that we cannot give him what is not already his and we cannot be his counselor, we have one choice, one thing that we can choose. No wonder we are often confounded and perplexed by the ways and the judgments of God. The whole of Paul's Roman epistle is glorifying the wonderful works of God while exposing the depravity of man. It details the glorious plan of salvation, the enormous sacrifice of Christ on the cross, whereby fallen man is not only released from slavery to sin, delivered from eternal condemnation and reconciled back to God, but also saved by grace through faith in him, made a new creation in Christ, made it, we've been made a citizen of heaven. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, bestowed with the riches of God's grace, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, eternally secure in his gracious love, and so much more. Those are the indicatives. Those are the things that God has already done. What wonder to stand before a God like this. The Lord is indeed rich in goodness and grace, mercy and love, wisdom and knowledge and power. And in Christ, we have too have been made rich in everything. For he has bestowed on us the riches of his grace in Christ Jesus, our Savior. And by faith, we have a rich reward that is kept in heaven for us all. The riches of his wisdom are unsurpassed, and the riches of his judgments are altogether righteous. His ways are incomprehensible. His knowledge is unsearchable. His love is never ending. I love, I, I shared this with my grandchildren yesterday. I heard a pastor once say, God can never stop loving you because he never started. Think of it. His love is eternal. He loved you for all eternity. His judgments are righteous. His strength is invincible. He carries out great and mighty works, which are marvelous to behold. And his glorious deeds are without number. Who can know the mind of this God? And yet... He has made his ways known to the children of men through the person, through the work of his dearly beloved son. And by his grace, we have the mind of Christ. Isn't that glorious? We have the mind of Christ. All things live through him and all things center in him. For he is the Alpha, the Omega, the author, the finisher of our faith. To him be all praise and glory forever and ever. Which brings us to our fifth point. In light of all this, we should give all glory to God and be content. Let me emphasize that word. We must learn and choose to be content with an utterly dependent, Christ-exalting joy in God. Now, this joy is not something I'm going to work up. This is something that God has given me in Christ. It's the joy of knowing God through Jesus Christ. Not only are all things from God, and through God, but as verse 36 concludes, to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Let this thought sink into your hearts and minds. Let me post it for you. You exist to make God look glorious. Let that sink in. Think about it. You exist, your very existence, your very creation, because 
God chose you. He chose you to make God, make him look glorious. In fact, let me back up. All of creation exists to display the glory of God. All of history is designed by God to one day be completed canvas that displays in the best way possible the greatness and the beauty of God. I think about Lady who does these marvelous, beautiful paintings when she gets started. I'm sure you you, you can't tell what it is, and it, it probably looks like, um, I'm sure Lady would be, agree to, with me, it, it probably looks like, not sure what that's going to be, but when she's finished, it is glorious. It is beautiful. That's what God is doing in all of history. It looks like a mess right now. But when he completes it, when he finishes, when he brings the consummation of all time, it will display the glory and the beauty of God. Jesus Christ came into the world to vindicate the righteousness of God and to repair the injury that we had done to the reputation of the glory of God. Your salvation is meant to put the glory of God's grace on display. Your salvation, the very fact that God chose to place his name and his claim upon you is meant to put the glory of God's grace on display. This is why God created the universe. This is why he ordained history. This is why he sent his son. This is why you exist forever to see and enjoy and show the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The question at the end of Romans 1 through 11 is this. Do you embrace this calling, that is to show the glory of God, as your treasure and as your joy? Do you embrace this calling to show the glory of God as your treasure and your joy? Well, let me just conclude with this. Don't forget the amen. That's at the end of the verse. Paul wants you to say, amen, so be it. Let it be to all that he has written thus far in Romans. In other words, I am helplessly, hopelessly lost in my sin, and I deserve God's holy wrath. Amen. My only hope for eternal life is that Jesus Christ shed his blood for me while I was yet a sinner. Amen. If he had not first chosen me, I never would have chosen him. Amen. I am justified by God's grace alone through faith in Christ alone. Amen. I now do not need to yield to sin because I am identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. He is now working all things, including my trials, together for my good because I now love him and he has called me according to his glorious purpose. Amen. He is now conforming me leading me from glory to glory to the image of his son so that one day I will be glorified with him. I will look in his face and I will be like him. Amen. Amen. Can you say amen to those truths? We are not just grudgingly to submit to these truths, but we are to rejoice. We are to glory in these glorious truths. Do you glory in these truths? Can you say with Paul in every circumstance, in every situation, in everything that's happening in our world, to God be the glory forever. Amen. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Well, I think we need to end with a song, another to God be the glory. So I'm going to play a song for you and I will close us out in prayer when I am done. And this is what, uh, please feel free to sing along with this, to God be the glory.
you can't play that song slowly. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. To God be the glory. Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Father, that you have chosen us in salvation to display your glory, your goodness, your greatness, Father. Help us day by day to serve you, to love you, to worship you, Father. These words can bring nothing but total worship and praise for our Heavenly Father for what you have done in us and through us. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your majesty, Father, for your goodness upon us. And we pray with Paul from you, from him and through him and to him, to you, Lord God, are all things to God be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. We will begin with Romans 12. <laughs> so glad to be with you. And I will see you around. May God bless you. And to God be the glory. <laughs>